Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Mentor Nation podcast. I am so excited to be back with you guys. It has been a month since I have released an episode, and most of that was just a lot of craziness. I've been moving, setting up the new podcast studio. It took a month for them to bring internet into my place. They had to dig and bury a line. And I just, I don't want to bore you with all of the details, but I am moved in. And although the podcast studio is not fully set up yet, I'm just so excited to get back to interviewing brilliant people so that you guys can benefit from their wisdom. If you're here for the first time, I would greatly appreciate you hitting that subscribe button. And if you enjoy the interview, hey, let's take it one step further. Please tell a friend. So speaking of brilliant people, (laughs) Just wait till you hear the gentleman that I am interviewing today. This guy is brilliant. Uh, Anthony Zhang is a serial entrepreneur. I mean, the guy is in his late 20s for crying out loud. He's already had two successful exits and his ideas, companies have been funded by billionaires like Mark Cuban, Mark Burnett, who basically created reality television, Shark Tank, Survivor. Um, He's just awesome. But his current company, however, is the reason that I wanted to interview him today for you guys. Anthony is the founder and CEO of VinoVest, and that's a platform that allows people from all over the world to invest in an asset class that most people don't even know about, which is wine. Now, get this, wine as an investment has outperformed the S&P 500 by a huge margin for the last 30 years with alternative investments going crazy right now and people looking for all kinds of creative ways to put their money into so that it can grow such as, I mean, there's things like NFTs and sports cards are blowing up right now, but this is an investment class that I really think you should pay attention to. And so I thought this would be a fantastic time to pick Anthony's brain on everything he knows about wine as an investment, why it's going to continue to outperform many other asset classes, and how you can get started if you're interested in just diversifying your portfolio. So guys, look, this is a great interview. So get your notes ready, sit back, and enjoy the interview. All right, we're live. Anthony, man, first, I just want to welcome you to the Mentor Nation podcast. I'm really excited about this interview. And uh, man, I just want to thank you for being on here and spending some time with us today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So researching you was, uh, was a lot of fun, uh, man, just, you know, <laughs> reading your bio, <laughs> you really like, you've done enough in your life to be like 55 years old and yet you're just in your twenties, man. So, you know, before we get started, I just want to congratulate you for just thinking big and just pushing the boundaries of what's possible and inspiring a lot of people on the way, man. It's awesome. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I've been very, very lucky to be able to um, find something that I loved very, very early in my life. So yeah. um, definitely, you know, really, really glad. And, you know, we're just getting started here. That's, that's awesome. So uh, if it's okay with you today, I really want to focus this interview on what really got me excited, just researching you. And it's just an asset that so many people are unaware of, know little about, which uh-huh is wine. And, and it's crazy because the first thing I did was I went to your website and right there, it's just like wine has outperformed the S and P 500 for the last 30 years. And, and I, it's, it's not even by a little bit, it's like by a huge margin. And so I'm just, I can't wait to pick your brain today. Have you share some awesome insights, but before we do that, I just wanted to have you start by just sharing a little bit about your story. You know, how did you get into entrepreneurship so early and, and what did that look like? And just, you know, what was kind of the upbringing? Sure. So um, grew up with immigrant parents, actually spent most of my childhood years abroad. So I spent some time hmm. um, in Hong Kong, Beijing for most of my life. And then I came here for high school and college. So um you know, kind of was straddling a lot of cultures growing up. Um, Always thought that running a business was really, really cool. Uh, But I thought that, like most people thought, you know, you got to get into a good college, then you got to get a good job out of college, then you got to probably go back for an MBA, and then maybe you're ready. Um, But I started my first 
side project would turn into my first company just a few weeks after freshman year started. It was a food delivery startup called Envoy Now. And our value proposition was that we could bring food to other co- hungry college students in a more convenient and faster way than you know, your Postmates or, or DoorDash because we were all students. We knew how to navigate the dorms. We had the ID access to get actually into the buildings. And you know, with food, right? Like just a five minute difference can be the difference between hot piping food and a great experience or like lukewarm food and then having yeah. to like go down the elevator or find, find the delivery person who doesn't know where we live, right? It's such a big difference that can be done in just a few minutes. Hmm. So was very, very lucky to have that uh, take off, um, had the opportunity to pitch a couple of really, really amazing um, kind of idols of mine. So pitched Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett uh, when they came to our school. And that's when I got my first investment offer. Um, so he offered me $100,000 for 10% of my business on the spot in front of like 3,000 students. And I was like, holy crap, is this So real? not on Shark Tank, like... No, not even, it wasn't even <laughs> planned. That was the craziest thing. Like I was in the audience. I was just what? skipping class because I wanted to see Mark Cuban. Um, and then at the end of his speech, he just started picking students from the audience to be like, hey, come pitch a real shark. No way. And for people listening, like most everybody knows Mark Cuban, but Mark Burnett, I am a huge fan of his. I mean, he like created reality TV, I think, like Survivor and all of these shows. And correct me if I'm wrong, like didn't Mark Burnett start off just like nannying for some rich guy's kids? Yeah, he has had a pretty amazing path to where he's at right now, right? Like Survivor. I think he also did all like the Are You Smarter Than a Third Grader or Fifth Grader yep. series and then Shark Tank. So I think, I mean, just the diversity of what those shows did for, I think, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world and being able to do like hit after hit is like pretty incredible. Wow. So before we pivot into wine, I just like, I have to add, because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this podcast, a lot of people just starting out and, you know, they're listening to what you said and, in their mind, I know they're thinking like, wait a minute, like he's a freshman in college, has this idea for food. Del- I mean, that's a lot. Like, did you build an app? Did you code it? Like, what Like, what did you do exactly to go from just like, I had the idea to building it to where it was successful and you raised money for Mark Cuban? Yeah. Yeah. Let me break it down to like the very early days. It okay. was just like a bunch of students studying in a library and one of them was like, I'm so hungry right now. I would literally pay someone like 10 bucks to bring me a Chipotle. You know? <laughs> I was like, really? I'll do it right now. Right. He gave me his order. I got on my skateboard, skated over to Chipotle, bought it, bought myself a burrito with the 10 bucks. And then, you know, he just then mode me. So there was just, you know, there's no app, no coding. It was, that was just it. And then I just, you know, put my phone number and my Venmo handle on a piece of paper, printed out a bunch of flyers and put it in my dorm hallway. And then I was like open from, I think it was like 6 p.m. till midnight because that's when I didn't have class. And I was just like, you know, I'd be doing my homework or hanging out with some friends. And then boom, I get an order on my on my phone. And then I just go skate and go do the delivery, bring it back. And then I'd you know just be doing homework again. So it was really just like no technology, no website, no app, no coding, just using what was already available to me and free to just at least like, get it started. And I didn't know like fancy words, like minimum viable product or anything yep. like that at the time, but that was essentially it. That is, that is insane. Well, that's super awesome. That is, that's incredible. So now we get to pivot into what you're doing now. And I just, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I love it. I wanted to do the interview before I bought some wine through you because I just think it's a fantastic, like I, and I don't know if you know him, but I have a mentor here in Nashville that, is one of the biggest wine collectors uh, in the country. His name's Tom Black. Um, okay. Yep, Tom Black. Uh, he owns Tom Black Wine. He has a, I'll send you a video as soon as, but he has this multi, multi, multi million dollar wine cellar in his home. And he has a couple of them. And he, he became ultra successful when he was young and then became just a wine fanatic and he's written books mm-hmm. on it. And so I've always been interested. I buy some wine from him. But when I saw your company, he was the first person I messaged and he thought it was awesome. He's like, man, this is, this is really incredible. So I just, 
I want to have you start by sharing a little bit before we get into your company. You know, why wine? Because alternative investments are blowing up right now. Mm -hmm. NFTs, sports cards are blowing up, cryptocurrency, Pokemon cards. Like, it's so crazy. So why did you choose wine? Like, why wine? Number one, I, I love to drink it. Okay. I like the way it tastes. Um, but I think just like you, I saw, I think the statistics in maybe a Wall Street Journal article or something like that, saying that it had outperformed the S&P and not just, you know, in 2020 or 2019, over the course of many, many decades. And to me, that was so cool, right? It's, it's a tangible asset. It has utility, right? People can sell it, buy it, actually consume it. And the fundamentals driving the price increases year after year really made sense because number one, you have the saying age is like fine wine, right? It means wine gets right. better over time. So most of these wines, they really improve with, with taste, uh, with the aromas as they get older, maybe 10, 20, 30 years for some of them. Right. So there's that inherent actual improvement in the asset where it doesn't depreciate the longer you hold on to it. Number two is just simple supply and demand, right? Um, there's going to be less and less of a wine from the year 2000 because people are drinking it, right? Once you drink right. a bottle of wine, you're making the remaining supply of that particular bottle more, more scarce and more rare. So those two things just really clicked with me from just a fundamental like economic standpoint. Yep. And I was like, cool, I believe in this asset class. I've done my research. How do I get my hand on some wine? And I think that's when I just fell into the rabbit hole of being like, oh my God, like learning about auctions, wine brokers, you know, wine fraud and all these, you know, wine storage, right? Perfect temperature and humidity and what you need for the perfect wine storage in your home. And I just came to the conclusion of being like, all right, there's a reason why only ultra rich people can play in this because it's so complicated and you need so much money and knowledge and know how to even get started. Wow. Now, was your first thought like, I need to learn everything or I need to find a sommelier or somebody that knows this stuff and then go through the business plan with them before we start the company? Like, or It was kind of a little bit of everything because I, I wanted to know everything. So I just talked to everybody like I was a potential wine investor, which I was. So through that exploration, you know, I was talking to songs, I was talking to wine brokers, I was talking to auction houses and, you know, professionals that have been in the space. And um, it was just so many different people to deal with. And I, right. coming from my background, I'm just like, hey, like, I want a burrito, click a button, it's here. I wanted a similarly easy solution for someone who maybe didn't have the time that I was spending to research a bunch of different websites, or maybe just wanted an alternative asset, right? Uh, to just click a button and boom, they're diversified. So that's really what Vino Vest aims to do is get you into this amazing asset class that has been around for a long time, but just really hasn't been made accessible the way other asset classes have been and let people have fun and, and make returns along the way. Absolutely. I just, man, I think that's so awesome, especially because a lot of the best business ideas are just so simple and so logical. Like one of my first guests on this podcast, so I love podcasting was he created Life Aid, which is an ener a healthy energy drink. Mm -hmm. And he's just this California surfer guy who was at the grocery store one day and he was just like going to give his son some, and like some of his energy drink he was like, man, there's a lot of sugar in this. And then he did like, he didn't even know what he was going to do. He just put a bunch of ingredients that he thought were healthy together, went to a flavor house. And now it's like a $200 million company. It's just, it's Amazing. crazy. So I, I can't wait for you to talk a little bit about VinoVest. So how, how does your company work exactly? And how does it allow average everyday people to start investing in wine, like right out of the gate? VinoVest is essentially a robo advisor for investing in wine. So uh, you come to the VinoVest website, Maybe you've got an investment amount that you want to put in to start, right? Maybe $5,000 to test it out. And then we ask you some basic financial questions like, how long are you planning on holding this investment, right? Yep. We're going to pick different lines if you're holding it for, you know, three years versus 10 years, for example. Second is, what's your risk appetite? If you're looking for wine to be something a little more stable and less volatile, which a lot of people are coming to alternative assets for, you know, we can choose wines that are kind of your equivalent of those blue chips. Um, if you're looking for a little more speculation, you can pick a more aggressive risk tolerance and we can pick some more 
emerging market clients. But essentially, like we get to know what your risk profile is, and then we do the hard work of then translating that into buying you actual wines. We have them stored in top of the line storage facilities all around the world. And then we give you live price data on you being able to check at any point how much your investments are worth. Ah, so, oh, wow. So you not only can check on your wine, but you can check and see if the value has gone up, what, in a week or in a day or in a, like every five minutes, if you want. Like I, I find myself exactly. sometimes going to Coinbase like 250 times a day or Robin. Oh, yeah. it's, addictive. Like, it is, it's, it's so addictive. So it's the same thing. You could see what your wine is. So there is... Is there like an exchange where live pricing data is is generated or do you just have a team of people that are constantly updating it manually? So we do have access to many exchanges. So hmm. uh, we're able to then aggregate really live pricing data that's going around all around the world. So both people who are buying and selling through the VinoVas platform and through our data feeds to be able to know what the most accurate price at any time is worldwide. That is so wild. You need to create a wine ETF. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Right? <laughs> and you can, boom, just diversify into like thousands of wines. Yeah, yeah, that, That'll be next podcast episode when you're like 29, you you'll start the ETF. So do, now you store and you hold all of the wine. Um, I And I'm sorry, I don't have a reference for this. The only thing I think of, right, is like silver or gold. Like they, yeah. they hold it for you. But can people actually hold the wine themselves or get it shipped to them one day in the future if they ever wanted to, to drink it or they built a wine cellar or something? Yeah, I think that's the coolest thing about wine is like you can actually do something with it, right? If like if you want to drink 10% of your portfolio, you own that wine, so you can do that. And that's something that you can't do with something like silver or gold, right? Like if you invest in silver and gold, there's no way, A, that you even know where the gold is or B, <laughs> like be able to be like, Hey, I want some gold. Give me some gold, right? They're not going to chop off a part of a bar and then send it to you. <laughs> and like, even if they could, right? Like, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> exactly. So I think the coolest thing is like, you own your wines. We're just holding on to it for you. And like, say you got an anniversary, right? Celebrating uh, maybe the completion of your new house. And then you're like, Hey, I want to drink some of my my wine wine collection that you know has been holding for me and we can help you facilitate that um, although most people are not looking to drink their profits i think the option to be able to is pretty cool wow now did you when you started vino vest like i mean it seems like it's doing really well and growing very rapidly did you have some like some missteps along the way on this company was there some things yeah, you're like I mean, oh we're, shit we're making mistakes and we're learning every single day and i think especially with how positively the market has responded to something like this. Um, we really feel like we're just like flying by the seat of our pants right now. We're in a stage of rapid hiring and growth. Um, you know, I think at a startup, you always feel like you're in, in a lot of chaos. Um, but I think I, I've, I've kind of learned to enjoy it too. I, I know that it's impossible to make everything perfect. Yeah, We want to do right by the customers. And I think the customers also understand if you're just, honest with them about a misstep or a mistake um, and explain to them and always, you know, do your best to do right by them and fix it. Um, you know, they'll stay with you. And not only will they stay with you, they'll appreciate that transparency. So that's really how we try to operate as a company um, where we are definitely going through growing right. pains. Yeah. I just, I really, really love your concept. You know, it's funny. I have a really great friend in uh, South Florida. She lives mm -hmm. in Fort Myers area and Guy is an entrepreneur, but he ended up like going to prison for tax evasion. And he got out and ended up starting this like network marketing company called Direct Sellers. And it was like a wine membership company. Oh, cool. And they blew it out of the water. I think it, I think it tanked because I mean, he didn't have a ton of integrity or anything like that. But in that experience, I just it was so crazy to see. Like I, I mean, I was a member, I became a customer. And it was just really cool to see different wines show up on my doorstep, like every month from like, you know, different reds, different whites. And it was mm -hmm. just, it was really cool. And I didn't think anything more of it, obviously, but I just, like, I looked at Vino Vest and I was just like, man, this is super cool. Cause you know, and I want to ask you this question. Cause I don't even know like what, like what types of wines just make like great investments, like rare, like 
old? Can you just go to the store? Like do any stores carry wines that end up becoming great investments? Or is it like, is there a certain principle that you follow with that? Yeah, I think um, that's, that's definitely a good question. I think <laughs> you definitely want to a look for the right regions. So mm-hmm. if you think about um, kind of the top wines in the world, you're going to France, right? Like rare Burgundy wines, Bordeaux wines, Champagne, parts of Italy. Of course, we've got Napa Valley as well. Uh, from those like th- from those key regions, then there's key wineries, right? Like just like you know, there's brands like the equivalent of the Apples or Amazons of the world. Right. There's brands in France like DRC or Chateau Lafitte, which are hundreds of years old. They've been making wine that's appreciated for you know centuries, and you can see centuries or you know many decades at least worth of price appreciation data. So from a modeling standpoint, um, our team feels very competent to be like, all right, you know, we see the year five, year 20 prices of these wines in the past. If we buy into this wine, you know, when it's two years old, we have a reasonable expectation of this month's appreciation by year five, year 10, uh, based on historical data and, you know, other factors. And I think that's the way to start. Um, right. it's, it's tough to look at a retail store because of I think the main component, which is storage, right? Um, if you, even if the wine say has been perfectly stored by the retail store, you know, you're then bringing it home. I don't know how everybody's wine sellers are, but it's really like um, kind of a toss up, right? When you try to sell it, how are you gonna go to a professional and be like, I stored it correctly, right? It's more of like right. a he said versus you said thing. And with VinoVest, we're buying direct from the winery, direct from the source where it's only going direct from the winery to a professional facility where it's under 24 seven, you know, security, surveillance, insurance, perfect temperature. So when we go to sell it, it just carries that much more value because you really know the full history of how it's been stored. And I think that's really one of the key factors of what a bottle of wine can go for 20,000 or 10,000 is the condition and who sold it. Man, that's, that is so awesome. So what's like, <clears throat> it, maybe it varies based on different wines, but like, what's like an optimal temperature, humidity, like what makes a storage or a wine cellar um, ideal for wine? Like, is it a certain temperature, humidity, all of the things, darkness, light? Yeah. Great questions. And I'm going to get pretty nerdy here. So stop me if it gets too. No, it's okay. I I love Um, it. Yeah. Temperature, I'd say around 50 to 55 degrees. Um, Humidity is around 60 to 70% humidity. Um, you want to keep it in a dark place away from direct sunlight and also away from vibration as well. So that's why our facilities, most of them are actually underground. Like one of them used to be a World War I bunker um, <laughs> and they converted it into a wine storage facility. So it's naturally damp. It's like a couple hundred feet underground and it's, you know, it used to be a bunker. So like there's no way anything is like, you know, touching that wine unless you want to. Dang. So, if a new kid like, still. Yeah, if a new kids and they have to escape, they'll be really taken care of. They'll have exactly right. darkness, yeah. safety, and all the wine that they can drink. Exactly. That's where I wish I spent my quarantine in. <laughs> that, that like, you know, nuclear war shelter. But Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the minimum investment um, for VinoVest? If somebody wanted to get started today, they went to your website and they're like, you know what? I want to diversify a little bit. Like how... Um, how can they get started or what's the the minimum that they could start with? Yeah, you, minimum, you can start with $1,000. That'll get you a couple of cases of wine and really just get a taste of what the platform is about, what to really expect out of the asset class and really learn as you go. Uh, and we've made that price point, you know, I think pretty accessible. Yeah. Um, and we really want anybody, regardless of if you drink wine or not, if you know about wine or not, to be able to feel comfortable enough to at least give us a shot. Absolutely. Now, in terms of like the the macro, the overarching investment portfolio, you know, what percentage of a portfolio would you recommend somebody devote to like wine? Like with crypto, my I have 10% of my investment portfolio, crypto, stocks, real estate. But like when it comes to something alternative like wine, like what is there a range? Is there some a percentage that comes to mind? Yeah, I think that 10% is that the number that a lot of smart retail investors have when they decide to allocate to an alternative, right? Especially say if you're putting 10% in something like crypto, which um, has a lot of volatility, you might want to counter that with 
10% to something that has a lot lower historical volatility like wine. So I think that is a pretty good compliment and something awesome. that a lot of our, um, a lot of our investors do when they're doing their portfolio allocations. That's awesome. Well, I encourage everybody to go check out Vino Vest as soon as this interview is over. And for the last part of this talk, Anthony, if you don't mind, I'd like to pivot a little bit just to like a more personal side, inspirational side for all the entrepreneurs listening that just want to build their own business, do their own thing, make their mark in the world. Because for you, you have a great story. You raise money freshman year in college, you, you know, Peter Thiel and just all of these things. But it like hasn't all been roses for you either. You know, I read that you had a really bad accident that paralyzed you. And I just was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that, because I think it's incredible that you've been able to build what you built despite having something like that happen to you. Like, can you just talk a little bit about that? Totally. So about a little over five years ago, um, I had an accident where I broke my neck instantly shattered my spinal cord as well. So I was paralyzed essentially from the neck down. So I became a quadriplegic and spent the next little over a year between ICUs and intensive rehabs to be able to um, not just recover, but like even learn to do the most basic things like, you know, breathe without a ventilator, um, eat, you know, eat with an adaptive utensil. So um, it completely flipped my life around and made me realize that life is really, really fragile. Um, so wanting to just spend the rest of my life doing something that I'd love doing. I think a lot of people maybe have, especially if maybe they haven't started their businesses are thinking like, Oh, maybe after I get this promotion, then I can leave or maybe next year I can leave or they always kind of yep. make an excuse to not pursue what makes them happy. Um, I was like, you know, damn, I just became paralyzed and I'm in a wheelchair. Um, who knows what might happen, right? So I want to work every day on something that can make me happy. Man, that's awesome. Like, are you still in a wheelchair? Yeah, still in a wheelchair today. Um, I've regained some mobility, but, you know, unfortunately, spinal cord injuries are permanent. There's wow. no medical cure uh, yet. And, um, you know, have learned to adapt and be able to still luckily do a lot of the things that I used to love doing just, you know, in a little bit of a different way now, man, that's awesome. You know, one of the, the people that <clears throat> inspires me, and I don't know if you've seen him, he's a, he's a politician. I think I can't remember where in George he's young. He's the youngest to ever, I don't know if it's the house or something, but he's in a wheelchair and he's in his twenties and he like beat everybody in this political race and he's crushing it right now. And he had a very similar philosophy, you know, to that. It's just like, you know, that thing that you think was the worst thing to ever happen. It woke him up to like, what's really important and allowed him to focus and focus on exactly what he wanted, prioritize things the right way. And it allowed him to just achieve a lot of success, man. That's uh, that's really, really awesome. So I want to end with just a little just big picture philosophy, some things that might've helped you. Okay. Um, I want to start, you know, talking to all the entrepreneurs listening to this, you know, can you just share something that has made a really big impact on you? Maybe something you read, some advice that you've received, or, you know, just some experience that has happened. Is there anything that comes to mind that's just really shaped who you are and why you, well, other than obviously, you know, the accident, is there something else? I think just during my initial kind of like recovery months, I did a lot of thinking, right? Because I was just staring at the top of the, you know, the hospital room ceiling for many, many months, couldn't even go outside. And I just realized like um, a lot of times it's just about being the next, you know, I guess I think just like persevering until the next day uh, you want to give up or you think something isn't working you might not know how close you are to a breakthrough unless you just try it. So I think mm. a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurship is just like failing, 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 learning, um, and then failing again. So Absolutely. I think you have to be comfortable with that idea of failure, um, not just in business, but you know, in everything in life, right? You're, you're at the gym, you couldn't hit a, you know, a PR, like try again next week, you know, try something yep. different or, you know, you're, I think that really applies to so many things in life. So I think just having that mentality that it's okay to fail, right? If you think about a game like baseball, like they're swinging and missing most of the time, but 
yep. on that home run, you know, it makes it all worth it. And same with, same with anything with like investors, right? Like if you pitch someone for your company, you're going to get like at least 50 no's before you get a yes. Um, so those are all things that I think can really apply to multiple industries and situations and really helped my mindset with being able to deal with failure. That's awesome. Yeah. I had a, a mentor that he shared a very similar philosophy. It's like, you know, it's like schools and growing up is what teaches you that failing is not okay. Cause you're punished for making mistakes. Like you do bad on a test or you make a mistake you're punished for. It. And he's like that mm-hmm. brainwashes people to be so afraid of failure <clears throat> and making mistakes that it paralyzes them and they never end up taking chances. And he's like, it's the people that really understand early on that not only is it okay, but it's like a normal part of the journey to success that, that really make those breakthroughs. So man, that's really awesome. I want to finish this Anthony with just three rapid fire questions. If you don't mind, cool. um, sure. I like to ask a couple questions. My first one is, is do you have a morning routine? If so, what is it? Yeah. So my morning routine is definitely different than most people's, um, you know, just kind of given my injury it does take me a while to get out of bed. So um, you know, just kind of getting dressed, um, kind of getting ready. We have a new puppy. So, um, just kind of spending some time with, with our puppy Duke. Um, and, um, you know, I think just really being able to reset, not have too many meetings in the morning and just have it as like a relaxing time to be able to spend time with my fiance, um, my dog and, you know, be able to go out for a stroll and I think just, that just like gets me in a really great mindset to be able to start my work day. Um, so I would say I'm an early morning person, but I don't really do uh, like meetings or things sure. like that in the morning. I usually like to push that later in the day. Awesome. I love that. Second question. If you had the ability to go back in time when you were first starting out in business and you could only literally spend with 45 seconds with yourself and then you disappear. Is there anything that you would tell yourself? Or is there something that comes to mind? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think the main thing is really, really be careful with the people that you spend time with, right? Because yep. your time gets more and more valuable. Um, you know, most people don't realize it until later, but um, I think just talking with the right people, spending time with the right people, that is like, the most important thing you can do to like upgrade yourself or downgrade yourself. So I think that would be my advice to my, my, that's awesome. The younger Anthony. Awesome. And that brings me to my final question is, is there someone that you follow that truly inspires you every single day? Oof. Um, I would have to say my fiance. I mean, she is the most important person in my life. She has, um, not only even before my injury, but, you know, after I got hurt, she actually dropped out of school to fully, fully take care of me. Uh, my parents were out of the country um, and I had nobody to be able to help me. And she was wow. there you know, in the hospital bed, like sleeping, on, sleeping on a chair, just to, like keep me company for months and months and months. And every single day, like what she does um, is incredibly wow. inspiring and is a big reason you know, why I'm even able to be here today and run a company. Um, and I definitely don't do it alone. Wow. Well, you better do a big wedding in that case. (laughs) I'm kidding. Um, my final is just, where can everyone follow you? How can they follow your journey? How can they, uh, find your company? How can they get started investing? And those of you guys listening, I really encourage you all to check out VinoVest. Um, I wanted to wait to the interview before I invested, but I researched it up and down and I really, really love what you're doing. Um, But I want to give everybody access to be able to just follow your work and your company. What's the best place to do that? So I'm I'm pretty accessible via Twitter. So you can follow me. My handle is Anthony underscore J underscore Zang. So that's my first middle last name. Um, And then um, feel free to reach out. Um, Email is anthony at bnovest.co. I always love uh, receiving emails. I respond to every single one, even though it's a short answer. And <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate your time as well and you know, everybody who's listening's time. So I'd like to get um, you know, first three months free on the BNOVest platform if you just reference uh, the podcast. So awesome. give everybody uh, an extra incentive to be able to give us a shot. 
Well, man, we appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you not only just sharing how your company works, why wine is a great thing to think about when it comes to investing, um, but more just digging deep and talking about the journey of entrepreneurship while talking about those things. I think a lot of people are going to get tremendous value out of this interview. So just want to thank you again for your time. And I really hope that in the future, I can have you back on the podcast uh, once your company is hit some milestone unless you go unicorn then you'll probably be too busy but somewhere in (laughs) yay uh but thank you again for your time anthony i really appreciate it awesome well take care thank you so much and i had a blast yes sir 